We talked about intro to blockchain. We talked about the intro to list, our sponsor. And at the second event, we talked about use cases, and we explored where some of those might go with, with the new emerging technologies. Today, we have some presentations for you about governance. Governance is a particularly relevant and relatable topic for everyone here. Everyone has some experience with at least traditional forms of governance. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce y'all to Matthew Chauvin, our first presenter. development, things like that. Uh, this is the second segment I'll be doing. The last one was an introduction to cryptocurrency as a currency. Uh, this time we're going to be discussing the future of governance and how uh, governance, had, the history of governance and how governance has now evolved since we're coming into blockchain governance. So I'll start off with a question. What is power? I want to think of, what do y'all think when you think of the word power? What comes to mind? Money. Money. Coercion. And, hmm? Coercion. Coercion? Control. control. Corruption. Control. <laughs> Money, control, things like that. Um, a lot of times when you think of power, you think of those things. You think of, you know, guns, money, uh, wealth, things like that. Um, when you go into, uh, we have a social, uh, sociologist, famous sociologist named Max Weber, and he described power is the ability of an individual or group to achieve their own goals or aims even when others are trying to prevent that group from realizing them. So when you think of power, you think, okay, well, money, that's power, right? Well, why is money power? Well, I like to put it where power is your ability to have the resources, the time, and the capability to take an action. In the case of Max Weber, his is you taking an action when there's actively someone trying to stop you. So you can look at that as freedom being power or power being freedom. If you can do whatever you want, then you usually consider that individual to be powerful, right? We like to think that people at the top, the elites, things like that, that these people have power because they can do what they want when they want. If you have the money, if you have the time, if you're in good health, no one can really tell you any to not do something. This ties in with the definition of governance. This is the definition given by the business dictionary. Um, it's that governance is the establishment of policies and the monitoring of the implementation of that policy by members of the governing body. It also includes the mechanisms required to keep balance or maintain the power of its members. So simply, governance is people giving up or deciding that their power should be given or allocated to a certain group, and then that group utilizes their power to create policies, and it's also part of that governance mechanism to ensure that those people stay in power or could be part of your governance mechanism to make sure they leave power at a certain time. And it's also typically the primary duty of a governance system to secure, maintain, and enhance the prosperity and viability of the organization. Typically, you don't create a governance system that's goal is to destroy the very group that it's governing. <clears throat> These are very common types of governance that you see every day in your lives. You have corporate governance. An example is Walmart. You have a CEO. Your CEO is elected or appointed by a group of directors. The directors are appointed by the stockholders. The stockholders are able to own stock by purchasing stock. This is a form of corporate governance. You see this at any corporation. You could even have a form of corporate governance that's like a sole proprietorship, where there's only one person in charge, but that's the governance chosen. You also have private forms of governance, like the National Football League. Each individual football team is its own corporation. Some of them are sole proprietorships, some are corporations, some are nonprofits, but they all are governed by a private group known as the NFL. They determine how many games there can be, player or money caps on players, 
um, regions, things like that. It's all determined by this private governance group. You have international governance. A common one is the United Nations. The United Nations sets up international law. They determine how you should deal with ambassadors, how you should deal with a situation that falls within a contested area or an area that no one owns, like out at sea. Um, and then you have some that are a little bit more subtle, like contract uh, governance. Relates a little bit to public governance in the sense that contract governance is kind of just there and decided by the public. Everyone just assumes that signing your name on a check or on a paper or something is a valid form of, of you um, determining or agreeing to that contract. But there's no particular rule that that exists. If you go to Texas, a handshake is considered a signature or the signing of a contract, whereas other places you actually need to have it written down with two witnesses. So varying from place to place, uh, that changes whether uh, signatures are validated or not. Um, you also have project governance, just like this blockchain meetup. Uh, you have to determine who's getting the food, who's presenting, when it's going to be, things like that are simple like that. Um, even something simple like a lemonade stand. Who's making the lemonade? Who's going to sit out at the stand to do it? These are forms of governance that you may utilize in your day-to-day -day lives, but you don't even realize. And of course we have a very common one, is public. You have the emergence of public-private partnerships. This is kind of a new one. Uh, you have the merger of government and the private sector. An example is in Arizona. They, the uh, national or the state forestry of Arizona gave up the governance of one of their areas of land or parks to a private corporation. Well, before they did that, they were spending a quarter of a million dollars maintaining that land, and now that private corporation pays them $50,000. And this is because of a public-private partnership. You also have free market competition. This is a form of governance in the sense that money buys things. Everyone agrees that money buys things. If you go into most stores or places, you give them money, they'll pay you. I've been out in areas where I was in the woods or out hiking or camping or canoeing and I needed something and I offered someone money for it and they accepted it because it's generally a public form of governance that you would trade and accept money and that there's free competition in the market. And of course, your most common form of governance, of course, are governments. Governments are created where groups of people allocate their power and give their power to these groups called governments who follow and create policy and enforce that policy. And of course, a new one is blockchain. This is a new form of governance that is a digital governance. All the governing is done via law and code set up on the, uh, on the blockchains that you choose. Uh, Bitcoin is an example of this. Now, before going further into blockchain governance and anything like that, I'm going to talk about some of the forms of government briefly because this is what we've been inundated with our whole lives. The human, humans, as long as they've had society, have had forms of governance. Um, you have your monarchies, that this is your more traditional forms of governance where you have a single individual leader, like a king or a queen. Um, the, only, the only real monarchies that still exist, there's a few, um, but usually you just have a ceremonial monarchy like in Britain. You have a queen, or you may have a prince, but they don't actually have any power in the Senate or to make any policies. You have oligarchies. Oligarchies are a small group of people controlling the governance and the policy making of an organization. Uh, you have a totalitarian government where it's usually the power is taken by force and usually they don't give it up unless you, there's force involved, like you think of the classic dictator taking over a country. Uh, you have aristocracies. These are a bit older when you had groups of nobles controlling the country. Um, a prime example of the downfall of aristocracies is the French Revolution. We saw how that went. Um, and of course you have democracies, which is what we have. It's ruled by the people. Originally, you had direct democracies where you would vote for the laws, you would go and vote for whatever was going to be passed in the Senate. But what we have is an indirect democracy. You instead elect an individual to go and vote on the policies and the laws to be done because you have other things to do. And of course, these days, economics has become so connected to governments and governance, they're starting to create these new socioeconomic classes and you can't really detach these from government. 
Um, you, the oldest was, of course, feudalism, where you had a form of governance where the leaders or the owners were usually nobility, owned all the land, everyone else was a serf. Uh, you have communism, where everything is ideally owned by everyone. Capitalism, where it's meant for the free market and to decide what things are done. Uh, you should, where your power comes from your ability to spend your resources and money. Of course, you have socialism, which is the government control or management of resources or things like water or healthcare, things like that. And then, of course, you have a welfare state where the governance system is to provide the people with welfare, with all their goods and needs. And, of course, you have down here anarchy by itself. Um, anarchy is a, a focus on the individual having the power and sovereignty rather than another group or organization over you. And, of course, you can't really just take one of these these days and say, okay, well, this government is an oligarchy or this government is a socialist government. These days, you have very broad mixes. So in the case of China, China originally formed as a communist party, but it pushes social agendas, but you can't really vote in a new regime, so it's totalitarian. So you kind of have, but they also utilize capitalism. So you kind of have a communist, capitalist, socialist, totalitarianism. In America, you would think, okay, well, we're a democracy, or maybe with some capitalism. But recently, in a Princeton study, they determined that the United States is actually an oligarchy, and most of the decisions and policy making is made by a small amount of individuals. Um, and you can, of course, pick and choose different ones to mix together. My favorite, of course, is anarcho-capitalism. Uh, that's connected to Bitcoin and cryptocurrency because it's said that Bitcoin and its creator, Satoshi Nakamoto, had a lot of anarcho-capitalist um, ideas whenever he first made his white paper and was talking about things. Um, it's kind of a, a thought that you should have capitalism, but you shouldn't have any regulations on it by overbearing bodies or organizations. And it kind of creates a dog-eat-dog -dog world, where for the anarcho-capitalist, if you're not doing your due diligence, if you're not studying and learning what's going on, then your uh, anarcho-capitalist is going to eat your lunch. And of course, uh, blockchain governance. This is where it all kind of ties together. Blockchains and cryptocurrencies, beyond just being a currency, are seeking to take over a lot of the goals and a lot of the duties of governments. People get together to form governments for their protection, to also create laws, policies, enforce those laws and policies. But blockchain is, is looking to take that over. And it creates its rules and laws through code. So instead of having a long, drawn-out process where you have to go through the Senate, you have to elect your senator, then get your senator to push through a bill, then he has to get his party to have his party whip, get everyone else that's in the party, push the bill, and then they have to fight against another party, and things like this occur. And most likely, you're not aware of the processes that go on in that. But with creating the laws through code, it's really simple. If you think that you have a better law, you create the code. And if people like it, they'll use it. Um, it's, all of this, of course, is enforced by consensus algorithms. Um, all of this we're going to talk in detail about in the next presentation. Just know that all of this, you can choose which way you wish to back and secure your cryptocurrency and your blockchain governance. And of course, it's all trustless. You don't have to trust your politician to be following through with his platform. You just simply check the laws and the rules of the code, and that's how it runs. There's no secrets. And of course, most importantly, it's voluntary. Until this point, if you wanted to opt out of a governmental system, well, guess what? Tough luck. Your governmental system was actually determined by the random location that you were born. If you happen to be born in one country, that's the governmental system you get. You don't like it too bad. If you want to get out, classically, you had to have a violent revolution. It's happened many, many times. If you don't like the governmental system, there's violence, and that's the way out. Or a refugee. Hmm? Refugee. Or, or you could be a refugee. You could these days decide to I'm leave. A, I'm a Soviet-era refugee from 1979. Oh, indeed. And then, in that case, you have to hope that somebody else is willing to take you in. And if they're not, they close your borders off, and we've seen that happen to many individuals. And the big thing about it being voluntary is, you don't have to use one. If you don't like Bitcoin, 
you can use another. You can use Ethereum. If you don't like Ethereum, you can use Lisk. If you don't like Lisk, you can use Dogecoin. You can choose to opt in to these governance systems. If you don't like the governance, then you can choose another one. So typically, when we come to war, blockchains instead have ports. What we've seen is that whenever there's a large disagreement between individuals in a crypto space, instead of going to war or having violence, they simply take the code and they fork off. It's a bit more complicated than that, and then we're going to go into details in the uh, later presentation. But instead of having this violence, you can just take your code. If you don't like that code, you can take another one. So as we've seen with Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, there was a lot of panic, but what happened? After there was a split, both of those coins increased in total value than there was beforehand. The same with Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. Ethereum forked off of Ethereum Classic, and the total crypto market cap of both of those coins was higher than when it started. So as, if history is going to repeat itself, it seems to be that every time that there's a fork, all the parties have the code that they wish to have, and everyone's happy. Looking forward, Traditional governance systems will likely adopt or adapt and merge with blockchain technology rather than destroy one another. A lot of people like to push the whole, well, okay, blockchain technology, Bitcoin, it's going to destroy the governments. It's going to destroy the banks. You won't even need banks in government because of Bitcoin. Well, I don't think that's true. And as we've seen, it's more so that governments are actually starting to spend money on researching into it. Uh, an example is in South Korea. They had a small uh, province decided to use blockchain technology at, as a test bed for their voting, to make sure they had secure voting. And I believe that in the future we're going to see more and more of this adaptation of governments and banks utilizing blockchain governance rather than attempting to fight it or destroy it. Politicians and lawyers will work closely with developers and programmers to create and implement new policies. Politicians and lawyers don't know code. They're not familiar with it. But coders and programmers don't know law, and they don't know the overarching effects of their code. So in the future, you're likely going to see these types of people working together, where your coder will work closely with your lawyer to make a proper smart contract that not only is valid code-wise, so you can't be hacked, you need to make sure that it's not going to cause any legal issues afterwards. There will likely be less reason for violence against competing organizations. As we talked about the, for, uh, the forks, instead of having violence against one another, even though there's a, there's a lot of contention, ultimately, everyone's deciding to fork off or go to a new chain or just do something differently. There's no need to have a fight over one another or over resources. You can create new resources. And of course, blockchains will, be, will give more power to the people than any other form of governance in history. And it's already begun to show that. For a very long time, especially with monarchies and aristocracies, if you weren't nobility, if you weren't the family that was in charge, you got nothing. But now, with blockchains emerging, it's more fair. You can look at the code, you can see what's in it, you can choose to use it. If you don't like it, you can switch off. And that seems to me like giving more power to the average person than ever before. In conclusion, Blockchains are an active experiment in creating and forcing, forcing socioeconomic policy. It's not even a decade old, this technology, but we're using it on a, in a very wide range. Um, and it's still an experiment. It could not work. We might find out in a couple years that this is the worst idea ever, and everyone in the crypto space loses all their time and money. I don't think that's going to happen, but it's just emphasis that we are still very young into this new form of governance when governance itself was hundreds, if not thousands, of years old. The results have caused experts and policymakers to reconsider their ideas of traditional governance systems. We're already starting to see governments and high-level researchers starting to look into new forms of governance. Um, a lot of this is like with the group R3. It's a, the top 15 or 20 banks of the world got together to try and make their own blockchain. Will it be successful? I don't know. But it shows that people are starting to rethink their old organizations and completely try something new. And of course, due to the vast disconnect between archaic governance systems and modern technology, many opportunities will be created for those wishing, wishing to bridge the gap between the old and the new. A lot of uh, individuals who are young typically have a lot of new ideas, fresh ideas. They're not as stuck in the old ways. 
But there are individuals who are older that are willing to learn. But they're the ones that are more connected. They're the ones that already have connections, people. They know who to talk to. They know who to vote for. Well, I think that in the future, you're going to start seeing a lot more of these young technocratic type individuals like ourselves, people who are interested in the future and things. And I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity for us to help bridge the gap between all of these older people who actually control the majority of the wealth. I'm not sure if people realize this, but the older generations control proportionally more wealth than the younger generations. Obviously, they've been around longer. But these people are going to be looking to learn about these new forms of governance and new things, and this is where all of us are going to come in to play. Yeah, and we're sponsored by this. Uh, are there any questions before we uh, take a short break and move on? I have a question. The, the very last point you made, going from oligarchy to technocracy, is that necessarily ideal? Is that a necessarily a good thing? Is that more democratic and idealistic? Um, I think that it's yet to be determined. I think that a technocracy would have its own downfalls. Like, you go to the judge, and the judge is a robot, and it doesn't care. It's going to kill you anyway, because that's what it's programmed to do. Um, but I believe that we're going to come to that point. I think we're going to have individuals that, like ourselves, that will have to create those problems and the solutions to them. But I don't think that we're going to get away from the fact that technology is starting to do the job of governments better than the governments. And so it'll be up to us to help make sure that that doesn't run away from us. We have to be careful. It may not be egalitarian. Uh, yes, we do have to be careful. But you never, like I said, it's an experiment, and we never know. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, in the intro, you said you mined cryptocurrency. You still doing it? Um, actually, uh, it's very hard to mine cryptocurrency these days. Um, that's why I'm getting involved in other consensus algorithms like delegated proof of stake and things like that. Um, but just recently, I did put back together an old mining rig that has five graphics cards on it, and I'm going to mine some random small coin just for the fun of it. Mm -hmm. uh, any more questions? All right, well, thank you for your time. Three. Two. Hello everyone. Hi. I have an excellent presentation for y'all tonight. Glad to see y'all again. This has been an excellent experience the past three meetups. And uh, so I'm really glad that we provide this for y'all again. Um, so without further ado, Blockchain Governance by Edward Trostler. I'm the mid-US ambassador for LISC, our sponsor. And so um, hopefully if that continues, so will these great events. So, how does blockchain governance work? I know we talked about a lot of the specifics of actual governance in the previous one, but how does blockchain governance actually work? Well, blockchains at their core are sets of strictly enforced rules determined by consensus. They use a consensus algorithm to, uh, to uh, secure and reach that consensus and also apply the, the rules universally throughout the system. Um, so here are some of the tenets of a good governance system, especially a blockchain-based blockchain governance system. It will be consensus-oriented. That means everyone will agree on the predefined rules. Uh, it will be participatory. It will follow the rules of law. In this case, the rule of law is the code. It will be effective and efficient, equitable and inclusive, responsive, Transparent and accountable. These last two are extremely important. These two, accountability and transparency, equals truth. So, what are some of the advantages it provides? Well, uh, it provides the foundation for all types of social contracts to be executed in a safe, transparent environment. Um, and even people who have never met can get together, agree on a set of rules, and uh, coordinate for the common good of the group. So, protocol level governance uh, refers more to the actual nuts and bolts of the blockchain. Uh, and at that level, 
uh, consensus is extremely important. Now, whenever there's a disagreement, we call that a consensus break. A consensus break would be a fork. Fork was briefly mentioned in the, pre in the previous uh, presentation, but here's a little bit about two types of forks there are. So in a soft fork, the, back, uh, the changes would be backwards compatible with the old rules, and non-upgraded nodes would be unaffected. Uh, typically, when a soft fork is proposed, it has a very high threshold to pass. In other words, more than, say, 95% of people would have to agree to it for it to be implemented. Um, with a hard fork, it breaks the old rules. So, old nodes are no longer compatible, and if they choose to remain with the previous version, they will be on their own fork. So, the consensus algorithms, the two main ones that we, that we deal with in cryptocurrency, are, is first of all, proof of work. Uh, proof of work is a, is a careful balance of cryptography, game theory, and economics that allows these uh, blockchain systems to scale. Uh, the miners secure the network by performing uh, computations, and so long as they follow the rules and continue the computations, they'll get a reward. If they don't, they'll be working counterproductively against every other participant in the system, which is very difficult to go back against history or um, the rest of the network within a blockchain. Um, in proof of stake, it's a system <coughs> for reaching consensus without miners. Um, in this case, the validation is done by the stakeholders. So everyone who holds a portion of the coin will get a proportionate amount of power to stake or receive the rewards from that coin and also generate blocks at that rate. Um, this is particularly uh, important and also an improvement because with Bitcoin you have to expend a significant amount of electricity um, and have all the specialized hardware in order to accomplish this. With proof of stake, you would simply just be holding the coin and you can use it to vote. There's no excessive computational energy expended and therefore the efficiency is vastly improved. It also gives a voice to every holder within the system. I don't know how many of you in here are actually cryptocurrency miners, but probably not that many. And um, so pro most of the rewards from Bitcoin are going to somebody else, right? Even if you bought Bitcoin, you probably wouldn't be able to get a piece. There's no dividends. There's no you know, rewards just for holding. Um, proof of stake is different though. And um, typically in a, in a standard proof of stake system, you'll basically get something that amounts to a dividend if you're holding. So there's another uh, important aspect of governance when it comes to the blockchains, and it's leadership. Uh, with Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto departed the project and removed his um, dictatorship over the governance of it. Um, by doing that, he ensured that no one party had too much influence over the three constituencies, the miners, the users, and the developers, that make up the consensus. This was extremely important. We still don't know where Satoshi Nakamoto is, probably never find him. That's the glory and beauty of the crypto anarcho-capitalist tree. So, with Ethereum, you have the brilliant young Vitalik Buterin. Um, now, uh, for Ethereum, having a centralized leader is actually, um, in my opinion, a feature and not a bug. And the reason is because Ethereum is extremely experimental <coughs> and emerging, and so it needs to be able to roll back and fix small bugs and issues. And if, for some reason, parties disagree with that, they can peacefully take their force fork elsewhere, like they already have with the mentioned Ethereum Classic at Oaks. Um, a lot of people, um, a lot of people had taken fault with the recent events that happened with the Ethereum Classic and all that. Um, a lot of people considered that to be a bailout uh, that was initiated by Vitalik and the Ethereum Foundation. Um, but like I said, I think that's really probably a, a benefit to the platform that they can, you know, roll over and fix things while it's still young. So, 
The question is, is the highly influential leader a bad thing? And I, I, I think no, because um, for, for Bitcoin, you know, if, if we did have one party who could influence, for, for example, the block size debate, it probably wouldn't have been a debate, right? It probably would have ended very quickly until she was here to say, eight megabyte blocks, or no, nah, one megabyte blocks. It would have ended there. Uh, this is the type of authority that Vitalik has over Ethereum. So, Lisk, our sponsor, has um, adapted the proof of stake algorithm to its own needs and uses. Proof of stake in and of itself is a nice idea. It allows everyone who has any amount of coin to have some amount of vote or power in the system. One coin, one vote, basically, is how you could break it down. Um, however, when every single participant in the system is allowed to generate blocks, that makes the system extremely clunky and it does not scale. It's too many participants. So the idea was to, to still use the economy of votes to choose a limited amount of generators that are highly contributing, merit-based, or offer a service to the ecosystem and therefore get the rewards of the block. Um, and so it's created like this hybrid compensation model that has allowed people like me to work for themselves and become a um, participant and recipient of the new cryptocurrency economy. So LISC is actually a natural liquid democracy. Now this might be something new to everyone here, but a liquid democracy essentially is a new form of collective decision making that gives voters full control over their decisions. That means if you don't like, there's no terms. If you don't like the vote that you placed yesterday, you can change it today. Uh, so if you don't like the delegate or the policy that you voted for yesterday, you can change it today. You're not burned for four years. Um, so it, it, it's, it's, it's a pleasant uh, departure from traditional terms and all that stuff. But um, you know, we're really running an experiment here with all these systems. So um, you know, everything may not translate to the real or the the, uh, the real world, so to speak, political uh, schemes. But a lot of this stuff is applicable, and the understanding that uh, and the fundamentals that people will understand once they learn about this stuff and what's wrong with the system now, it's really important that we get a hold of it. So, in LISC, you have the stakeholders, all of which are holding coin, and so they have a vote in the system, and they all have their different motives. The investor, the delegate, the developer, and the user are all, could all be different stakeholders. The investor will invest money to make profit, and therefore he wants LISC to be popular and valuable. Delegates, like myself, seek election, so we contribute. We find ways to um, apply our skills to whatever the blockchain community is looking for. Developers are, LISC especially, is looking for developers to come contribute, and you can basically plug yourself in and become a part of the economy now. This is not a joke. Um, so the developers themselves, <coughs> or excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, so after we seek election, um, our job is to secure the network. So we have to perform that well, or people will vote us out, right? If we're, if, we're not, if we're not running the network smoothly, if we're not keeping to our, our promises that we made as a delegate. For, for example, I have promised to host these meetups all around the country and do other things. If I renege on, renege on that deal, maybe, um, they would, maybe they would unvote me. But uh, right now I'm in good favor, so. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the ultimate goal there, the motivation, the reason why you uh, compete in this ecosystem and do this stuff is to earn the rewards. Everyone's here for the same thing. And so um, ultimately that incentive and that motivation is extremely important for the ecosystem to work properly. Um, and again, you see there a few things that the delegates would want, popular, secure, stable, and valuable. Um, now as far as the developers are concerned, the developers are obviously waiting for the platform to be complete, for the tools to be available, because that's what's currently happening with LISC. They're developing a set of tools that will allow you to develop applications 
using the blockchain technology. Easily, simply. Just, you want to launch a coin today, you can sell an asset on Lisk. Um, and, and then you can then code it on the back end. But um, similar to the uh, ICOs, ICO sales that are going on on Ethereum now, uh, the same type of thing will be going on on Lisk because it is a platform for applications, smart contracts, etc. So you'll start to see a lot of that stuff soon. Um, and obviously the developers also are motivated by the same things as everyone else, right? <laughs> Money, turn rewards. And so therefore they need Lisk to be accessible, attractive, flexible, popular, scalable, secure, stable, usable, and valuable. Um, and last but not least, the users. It's very important uh, that if the users aren't having a good time, a good experience with this, the platform will die. It'll, it, it'll, go, it'll go belly up. Because eventually, this thing has to start turning profit off of the user, off of the fees being spent, off of the applications being registered, off of all these things that the network can do, registering tokens. If people aren't using this stuff, if it's not accessible, then the platform will die because it's dependent on people using it. It can't just be a store of value with speculatory value forever. Eventually, it's got to either deliver or not. Um, I can tell you all confidently, though, I've been following the development of this very, very closely. They are keeping a lot of stuff very close to the cuff, but there is a ton of progress. I highly suggest that you all check out the GitHub. Uh, it's github.com slash listhq. And uh, that's where you can get the real concrete information about what's going on. Everything else you see on the internet, just comments. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, so this is uh, pretty much all I had to say about governance and list. Does anybody have any questions? Can you tell me more about the voting? Like I understand like people voted for you and what are, the, what are some other things that are voted on? Well, right now, the only thing that's being voted on is who the, who the validators are. Um, and that's on the, the, the network level. Uh, that's something you can do right now. Later on, there will likely be um, options for integrated into the protocol where you can vote on the next series of changes. Or um, there's, there's going to be all type, of, um, all type of choices for you to make once these applications start being developed. But um, I think there's going to be a lot of possibilities for um, people to vote in um, like a lot of different uh, decision making processes for the, f the future, you know? Um, does, does your organization like use any tools for, I guess, like predicting or like modeling uh, like the decisions that you're going to make like and it, and it affects, I guess, like in the future? Uh, well, so so uh, I myself am a freelance. Um, I do you know technically work with the project. Um, this case Q though has the actual development group, and they're based in Berlin. Um, they do have a ton of. Uh, they work with a strategic service to decide a uh, strategic branding service to decide what they're going to do with the future and stuff. Um, they have um, you know all different type of. Uh, control processes that they, they do to, uh, to make sure that they you know cover each point um, they're really they're really uh, thorough about everything uh, I wish I had a little bit more information about that but sorry what about the I read about the 100 super delegates with list yeah okay so um, there is 101 delegates um, and if you hold this you can vote up to 101 times and that'll allow you to choose the list of the 101 people who are getting the awards. Um, now, most of these people who are who are um, running for a position uh, as delegate have already made a proposal. So, for example, my proposal is that I'm going to go around the country, run meetups. I'm going to, you know, um, support. I'm going to moderate this chat. I'm going to do all these other things that that I can do, and um, people will vote for me. And so, by virtue of that my rank has gotten into the top 101. And so now, blockchain pays me. Um, and that's basically the, how it works. So the, it's, a, it's a meritocracy, but it's also, it's also based on, loosely on how much you're holding and, and to swap with other people. Um, but uh, considering that the participants within the system, in order to be a participant, you're already putting your money up. So the connotations change. Like, Technically, people are paying other people for votes, and in the in the, in the traditional world, that sounds like 
really corrupt. Like, right? Like, you're giving somebody a kickback for voting for you. That yeah. sounds ridic ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But when, when you understand that you're coming to the table as money to be a participant, you're coming to the table as the coin, you, you, your identity means nothing to the blockchain. Your coins do, though. And so when you look at it that way, the context has changed. Thank you. You mentioned that um, one of the incentives for developers is that they earn rewards. It's open source, so how, okay, how do they get um, compensated? So the delegates like myself are highly active in finding extremely active contributors. Um, and many of us who are getting paid have promised certain amounts that we'll donate. And there's 101 delegates. Many of them are getting extremely overcompensated. And they're begging to find somebody who will, give, who will add value to our platform to give them some coin. Uh, to get them started on the platform, to have them, you know, holding a piece of this, so they want to build it together with us. You know. What else? Yes. Is there a total supply cap? Or? Okay. So the the uh, emission is technically infinite, but it's but the inflation total is going down. So this year there was five lists per ward per block in 40 days or something like that, because we're almost past the first year, um, it's going to go down to four. And then each subsequent year it goes down one until it's a permanent one. Um, there may or may not be some portion of the list that's consumed with the, um, with the registering or uh, use in the future. And if that's the case, then you will have to have some sort of um, emission. Otherwise, eventually all the coins will be burned. Right. Yeah. Seem to be working with pieces of dust. Uh, is there a place for anyone who's interested, like a developer, to look for like list bounties or anything like that? If they were trying to get involved. There definitely is. Uh, so I run an organization called List USA. Uh, you can check it out, listusa.io. And we actually do have a program called our scholarship program, and uh, basically we choose. So, but if you'd like to tell us what you do. Um, and definitely, if it's if it's you know um, a, a contribution to the ecosystem, then we're gonna we'll honor it. You know, we'll, we'll we, if if we like it and it's a contribution, we're gonna we're gonna you know we're gonna make, tell people that hey, look, this is going on. Y'all should donate to it. Like, and the organization does that as well. So, um, but um, beyond that, if you just become a participant participant in the community itself, you join this chat, you uh, you know. Join the Reddit, join the conversation, so to speak, and um, you might find that you have an applicable skill, something that you can do. You'd be surprised. I'm not a professional developer or anything. Um, I have some some uh, some previous experience in it, but um, and I thought that that would be the only way to get in. But then I found that hey, there's a lot of outreach that needs to be done, marketing, uh, you know, all type of stuff that you wouldn't expect. Uh, and there's it. Really, the uh, donations and contributions are relative. So you might you might draw a picture that somebody likes and just decide they're going to donate to you. You know, just because you were funny, or, or maybe you came up with a good idea or a good contest. But that's the the platform that allows all of this um, socioeconomic activity to to emerge and begin. It's really just an incredible incubator for for the future. Um, why? I mean, I know you know there's a lot of different uh, blockchains and different currencies. Um, specifically about this, I'm wondering what is what's special about. It. I know I know some stuff about JavaScript. I know some stuff about like what. So the, the, okay, so the so Lisk solves two extraordinarily fundamental problems that cryptocurrency, including Bitcoin and Ethereum, have not solved. So number one um, is that it uses delegated proof of stake. Delegated proof of stake is, well, first of all, Ethereum plans on moving to proof of stake anyway. Um, but like I said, proof of stake in and of itself does not scale. So Ethereum already doesn't know what they're going to do. Like they, 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 have some, they have some ideas, but proof of stake is probably not going to work for the future. With delegated proof of stake, it solves the fact that there's too many block validators. So everybody who's voting just selects 101. And those 101 can be extremely efficient. They're getting highly paid so they can have like, you know, dedicated server houses or you know, multiple dedicated servers that they can afford 
to host the uh, computations of the network and all that. But um, so delegated proof of stake is the first part that actually blockchain can't even continue until you scale. So delegated proof of stake solves that. And then you have let list to solve the blockchain bloat issue, which basically as Bitcoin goes on, the blockchain is getting bigger and bigger. This is starting to price out some of the people who want to host a full node, like you and me, because it's this hard drive you need to start storing is getting bigger and bigger. Eventually, you won't be able to keep this hard drive in your computer. It's going to be too expensive. Um, and so, Lisk has proposed an idea called sidechains. And the sidechains basically store the majority of the extra data that the platform would need to do applications and smart contracts in a voluntarily hosted sidechain. And so, basically, as we've seen with um, also with CPU development, we've found that Intel can't get any more juice out of a single core. They just have to they have to they have to parallelize. They have to they have to make more cores, and they have to make those cores smaller so they can fit the ball in one space. But ultimately, they can't get more out of one. And you're seeing that across all types of computing platforms, not just in CPUs, and even in these distributed networks, where basically uh, it's just too much computation. If the, if the network has to handle every bit of history that's ever happened and every contract that's ever executed all at once, it's not going to scale that way. So that's basically Lisk has proposed a scaling solution. Um, it's, it's solved the block size, uh, or excuse me, the, um, the chain size issue. And it's also created both a liquid democracy environment that pays its merit based contributors. So basically the side chains would handle like the mundane, I mean, I guess. Like well, the, the, platforms for, the platforms for apps, um, and that's that's what it's for. It's basically going to allow you to, to build an, a blockchain-based application. Um, so each one of those applications, when you launch one, will have its own side chain. So if you want a blockchain, you want a blockchain, you want a blockchain. <laughs> yes. Trust me. Uh, do the delegates validate the side Yeah, okay, so so the there's a few ideas that um, obviously this stuff, you know, this is not not released yet. But um, so the first the first way that one way it can work is that there will be a delegate marketplace. And basically for all the standby delegates who are trying to compete compete to get in a one hundred slot, they will be able to go to the marketplace and side chains that need delegates will be able to um, you know, put up a reward for their service based in that sidechain coin. Because each sidechain also has its own cryptocurrency. That's what you're launching your own coin. So you, can, you, launch an I, you can launch an ICO, which is where you sell the token, and that token has its own space in the blockchain. It doesn't pollute the main chain. And it can be transferred back and forth from Lisk to that token without having to go to a centralized exchange, by the way. Um, and uh, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty vast outlook there, you know? Okay. But, uh, anybody else? Uh, is, a, is a name inspired from a functional programming language? I don't think it's inspired from that, but it might be. <laughs> anybody else? What's going on with this rebrand that's supposedly happening soon? Yeah, so they, uh, they've been working on the rebrand for months and months now. They're working with two companies, uh, Tachyonaten and Relevance. These are two major, probably some of the best. They work with Microsoft, Uber, these types. Um, just to give you an idea of, of you know, how this is operating. Uh, but, uh, they, but they are extremely deep into that process. Basically, what they're doing now is they're actually coding. They've already done like new logos, new st new strategy, new everything, mm -hmm. um, just ready to go. But they're actually coding the website. So design's done, lo the new logo's done, the name's the same, um, all their strategy's done. They just haven't actually released the new logo and the new website yet, but it, it's, it's right there. So um, I would expect that pretty soon. When is the SDK gonna be released and is it gonna be at the same time as the rebranding? So, uh, no, the, the rebranding is not going to be at the same time, and the, uh, the rebranding is coming within the next few weeks, next two or three weeks. We just entered quarter four of the year, and so the uh, SDK is technically promised as an alpha for quarter four. Now, quarter four can mean December 31st, 
but and I think it will. But <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, we're expecting to shoot. It's been promised. I think there's going to be something. Anybody else? All right. Well, uh, we have one more presentation for y'all. It's going to uh, explain a few things about entering the, the cryptocurrency market and the uh, pitfalls you might face by our good friend Vincent Selfo. I'm going to come, uh, we'll get you set up. Yeah, right? All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, I hope everyone got a little drink, back in the break, and set up for a minute. So, my name is Vince Selfo. Uh, I am from here, a business finance background, tech enthusiast, but didn't really get into blockchain until I came to the first meet up here in the spring. So, today I'll kind of be talking about, for those of you who are looking to get into blockchain, to get started, how do you start, how do you kind of take those baby steps to get into the market and go from there. Uh, so, we'll kind of be a basic primer and uh, get you started. You're proving that you're holding and so the blockchain is the way. which way? <laughs> okay, backwards. Good luck. There, there you go. go. Okay, so we're going to talk about how to buy this, how to hodl, and how to learn. So hodl is hold on, don't leave. It just means that these currencies are very volatile. If you do not check the price every day, it will give you heartburn. <laughs> uh, so just hold on, don't leave, buy. Just think of all the money you're going to make years down the road. And then now that you've entered and opened up Pandora's box, how do you learn and continue your education and knowledge for this? So. How to buy less? First, you gotta buy Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the gold standard of crypto. Uh, everything trades in Bitcoin. It's blockchain 1.0. It is the be all and end all of uh, Bitcoin uh, and blockchain currency. So you gotta have Bitcoin to buy less. That's step number one. How do you buy this? I mean, I'm sorry, how do you buy Bitcoin? Very simple. Uh, everyone has apps just like Venmo. You download the Coinbase app. You attach your bank account, and you got some Bitcoin currency. Very simple. It's a large U.S. company, insured, very safe, very simple. It's as easy as it looks and seems. Uh, and that you're going to you might see some time delays depending on that, but you can invest small amounts, large amounts, lots of options. Uh, so quickly. Uh, a hot wallet versus a cold wallet. While your money is in the Coinbase app, it's going to be in what's called a hot wallet. That means it's an online-based wallet. The Coinbase company, which is insured, has your money, and they control the codes. And I couldn't get to the technicals of it, but it pretty much means it's an online-based wallet, uh, and that is one level of security. Then you have a cold wallet, which means an offline-based wallet. That means that you control the password and information offline. Things, examples of a cold wallet would be a Trezor or a Ledger Nano S. That's going to be something where you're really secure and you're keeping your passwords and never entering the internet, never hackable. Everything I think is always potential, but that is a hot wallet versus cold wallet. And all the things we're talking about are going to be hot wallets, which is why we're going to talk about the importance of storage. So. The hot wallet storage is a little more risky. The cold wallet is another level of security for you. Uh, for Bitcoin, cold wallet storage, like I said, the Ledger and the Trezor are the really simple, easy to use ones. So now you have Bitcoin, what do you do next? All right, you gotta move to an exchange. There's a lot of exchanges out there. I'm sure you've heard of many, Kraken, Changely, Shapeshift, Bitrix, Plonix. There's hundreds out there all across the world. The key is high volume and high reliability. Uh, each currency will have a wallet connected with the exchanges, so each exchange may work better with other currencies, some currencies than others. So it's really important to be on top of all the information. For instance, when I first came to the first meetup, Poloniex was the most recommended exchange for LISC. Now, Bitrix is the best one for uh, trading LISC. That may change in another six months. Uh, only time will tell, but it's very important to keep up on updates and to make sure that you're always uh, paying attention to 
volume, credibility, reliability. You do not want to ever store your cryptocurrency on an exchange. An exchange is for sending your money to and taking your money out of. It's an exchange should be simply what it is to exchange your currency of one for another. After that, you want to move it into a secure stored location. So just to give you all a little preview of what Bittrex looks like, and I think it tells a lot of the story about cryptocurrencies when you just look at the platform. So this is the Bittrex trade view. Uh, just at first glance, it looks like it could be an E-trade, it could be a first trade, it could be any one of a number of uh, prime time, big financial trading networks. You're going to see a wealth of trading information, trends, buy walls, sell walls, bid, ask spreads. All of the things that you typically see in trading, you're going to see on these platforms. That's how well developed they are, especially Bittrex. One thing that kind of, to me, uh, is the canary in the coal mine of what this technology can do is the fact that there is no closing bell. 24-7, 365, you can buy, sell, trade on this network. There are no holidays, there is no Columbus Day, there's no, it's four o'clock, everyone's done for the day. So you're immediately seeing a three to four times increase in efficiency, efficiencies just in the trading. And we're at square one. So in the simplicity, is very easy to use, very user friendly. So you're gonna send your Bitcoin from your Coinbase, you're gonna hit that little send button, it's gonna to go to uh, Bittrex, and once it's in Bittrex, then you gotta buy your list. All you gotta do, there's a buy list button at the bottom, you hit buy list, and you got list. Uh, it's very simple, very straightforward, and actually at the end we're gonna have a link to a nice step-by-step -step screenshot of what I'm talking about, it'll walk you through very simple, straightforward. Uh, so, now you've got your list. Uh, you've traded your Bitcoin, you've sent it to the exchange, now you've bought your uh, Bitcoin for list. Now you want to hold that list for a few years, right? You want to hold it, you think, in, in a few years down the road, you're trying to hold it securely, and hopefully your kids will pay their college tuition since you spent their money on list instead of on <laughs> And that is going to be List Nano. Uh, super simple. You go to list.io, you download the List Nano application, you open it up, you hit create passphrase, you got an account. That's it. Uh, so that is going to be uh, your passphrase is all that you're going to get. There's no IDs, no nothing. It's a 12 word password. And you got to make sure that you do not lose that passphrase. If you lose the passphrase, there's no 800 number in India you can call to help you out. It's gone. So it's very essential that you do that. A recommended is for five additional lists to buy a second passphrase. At that point, you're going to have a 24 word long passphrase. So I don't think that's hackable, but I'm not a uh, computer wizard, but it sounds pretty complicated. Computationally infeasible. There we go. Uh, and at 24 words, your brain can't even remember the words, so you better make sure you put it in a safe place. Uh, for this, it is kind of getting to the cold storage side, uh, and Edward may be able to answer properly the hot, cold, because there is not a Trezor uh, Nano Ledger for this, but... Actually, we're, we, we're, we're funding the development of one right now. Perfect Ledger Nano, or Ledger S, excuse me. Okay, fantastic. So soon you will be able to have pure cold storage. Uh, so that'll be another level of security. A good way to store your passphrases is now we're high tech, now we're gonna go low tech. Old school, pen and paper, give it to a lawyer. If you don't trust your lawyer, he can take your money overnight. So be careful with who your lawyer is. Uh, safe deposit box, things like that, really simple. Uh, keep multiple copies is the way to go. Because as I said, if you lose it, it's gone. Um, so, and then now that you have your list, it's time to vote for your list uh, to receive the dividends. That's when you vote for Mr. Stellar Dynamic, Edward Trosclair. I definitely recommend everyone voting him. Uh, after that, it gets tricky. You do get dividends. It's not that much, it's kind of small, but it does add up. 
Uh, especially, as we talked about earlier, if you're an optimist and you're envisioning these being $1,000 each one day, it's very helpful. Uh, it's kind of a, it becomes very complicated on the voting, so I'm not going to go into the voting at all, other than you can vote your list and receive actual dividends, so your list is now making you more list. And that's something that when you go into additional information at the end, you can deep dive and go down the wormhole of as much information. One group of, uh, you know, there's a list elite group, and there's a GDT pool, and then there's this guy and that guy. You get lost, but you can spend a lot of time and fun and downtime and trying to take a break from work on this stuff. And then that is really it. Uh, it's really that simple. Uh, it's in five easy steps. You got your list. Uh, you download Coinbase. You buy your Bitcoin. You transfer to Bitrix. You buy your list, and you transfer to List Nano. That's it. Very straightforward. Very simple. Uh, five steps and. As I said, uh, that is going to be something that will even have a screenshot available. Uh, <laughs> Got, uh, the battery. There you go. There you go. Uh, it's listening. So, um, so this is a summary of the presentation, the five easy steps. One, two, three, four, five, you got it. Now for a quick walkthrough of that in a screenshot format, is going to be this Tony Yen link right here, the ultimate guide to LISC. You Google that, there's going to be exactly what I said, screenshot, one through five steps of how to do it, what button to click, hit the plus sign in Bitrix, and hit the minus sign, copy your address, all the kind of minutia that we kind of Breezed over, will be reviewed in that. Um, uh, for additional list information, when you really want to learn a lot more about it and really start getting into it, list.io, list.chat, academy, the Reddit is great. Uh, the chat and Reddit are going to be the two active areas where you can really start to learn about, about it. Uh, a lot of people from different backgrounds, I guess I'm more of the uh, investor user. Developers, you really have a lot of different groups. Uh, I know JavaScript is part of the big things people talk about it. I know a lot of y'all are developers here. Very JavaScript friendly is what it's built in, and that seems to be a very common language. So if you know JavaScript, you can get on development of this stuff and very straightforward. And then I just included a few additional Bitcoin learning sources. Nick Zabo is one of the preeminent guys in cryptocurrency. <laughs> Uh, he came up with, he invented smart contracts. He is a guy who really, if you look at his blog, The Unenumerated, it's really a fascinating economic, political history of the world and the way that he describes things of how civilization developed. It, you strangely see how Bitcoin and blockchain currencies are no different than ancient shells and beads used to trade and barter. And it really connects it from, how is this strange Bitcoin technology real? Well, you're just thinking of the dollars that we use today, but look back through our history, it's just the next evolution in money technology. Naval Ravikant is a, a big forward thinker on this, a big believer in additional blockchain technologies. They're great to follow on Twitter, 140 characters, easy to consume, never gets old, uh, and fits with today's attention span. Uh, the Nakamoto Institute is just the history of Bitcoin, the history of blockchains. Uh, what did he actually say? If you want to know who was Satoshi, what did this guy say? Did he exist? He did exist online, and all of his quotes can be found there. So if you want to read his thoughts on anything, you can go there and read all that you can about him. Um, so really, uh, that is the key kind of fundamentals that I want to talk with you all today. So how to buy a list, how to hodl, and then how to learn more. And that is it for today. So does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. So is, it, is Ethereum the same kind of a application? Or? Ethereum would be another blockchain, so Bitcoin, I guess, is the 
father of blockchains, and then everything uh, has kind of followed off of that. Uh, Ethereum has different, as Edward was saying previously, different governance mechanisms, different, it has different computer code, so a uh, list is in JavaScript, Ethereum is in Solidity, so if you look at what can kind of scale, when you look at, uh, uh, kind of a, going back to Nick Zabo, he talks a lot about the network effect of the Industrial Revolution, uh, canals, human power, muscle power, the closeness, and, and how you need to reach uh, pastoralism, certain network effects in order to achieve a certain goal. So LISC has a higher potential of reaching a network effect because of that. So the, Ethereum people are, are building things and putting them on the Ethereum network. They're building uh, applications, I guess. And so um, is this just a newer one and one that's, you know, are you just using it as an example or is this... Um, uh, is it, it seems like everybody's going to Ethereum to, to put their applications on. So Ethereum's, I think, about three years older than LISC, and it's a much more developed, it has the things, uh, as Ed was saying, in, in three more years from LISC, if you look at it from that perspective, the SDK will be fully infused, so any JavaScript developer in the world will be able to use. I think LISC is going for a similar direction, uh, but with the you know first guy in, they do a lot. You learn a lot, and they're improving, kind of like a, maybe their blockchain 2.0, 3.0. So their goal is, I believe, they're younger, so it's much newer. It's only a year old, and in the next year, you're going to see the tools come out that allow people to build applications on it. So LISC is still early, and it has those kind of. Uh, fixed it, uh, problems that Ethereum has of the blockchain bloat. Ethereum is already bigger than Bitcoin, even though it's, uh, I think it's 2013 and Bitcoin is, is twice as old. But Ethereum is already a bigger blockchain. There's a lot of bloat. So uh, I've talked about the side chain. So the side chains makes it to where it's very scalable and lean. So that's kind of the you know, say the killer applications of LISC versus other ones is JavaScript, side chains, and, and the governance mechanism. And Ethereum doesn't have side chains? No. No, sir. No. So this, this is something that you are enamored by, right? Correct. Yeah, I came to the first one. I didn't even know. I just saw a blockchain meetup. Uh-huh. And then it was LISC. And I'm like, that sounds awesome. I'm getting some. So I came, I came late, so the presentation was on the list. The previous yes. ones, yes. Yeah, so that's why it's dominating the conversation here, because there's a lot of different blockchains. Right? Correct, yes, sir. And this is a list sponsored one. Oh, I see. Um, so I'm that's. Sorry. <laughs> I got it now. Correct. So list kind of has the free drinks and food is list. So, and, and LISC has a good guy online too that'll give you the basics. Yes, sir? Is there anything Ether can do to fix the bloating problem? Like follow this and what they're doing? They just proposed sidechains. Yeah, they actually. Proposed that. They, they just the proposed platform. their first idea for sidechains. But they're way behind this. So, and it's not even the, uh, it's not even the, the guarantee, or it's not the agreed upon proposal. According to Ethereum, they're going to go into a scaling solution called sharding which uh, doesn't have anything to do with side chains. But now there is a proposal, I think it's even at least co-written by the founder of Ethereum, Vitaly, that does suggest that they, they could try side chains as their scaling solution. I think that really validates the list approach. The fact that Ethereum is now gonna have to go to that approach. So. Yes, sir? Uh, I think to add on to this gentleman's uh, question, um, the biggest thing about list, like for me personally, I've, I've mined and been involved with like a dozen cryptocurrencies and for LISC, like yeah, it's sponsoring the event, but the reason, at least for me, I'm involved in LISC, uh, like Mento was saying, is once I learned about LISC, this was the first like altcoin that I was like, okay, well, this is actually really interesting, really different, a lot of people can get involved with it, it solves a lot of solutions to other problems. And I would recommend doing your own research, but the reason we're picking LISC is because out of all the hundreds of different chains you could choose from, 
list actually has a lot of promise that, at least to me and others, that it's showing. And that's why we're kind of supporting it. Because we wouldn't support it if it wasn't a good side chain or a good alt current, uh, chain of well, And my kid's education uh, put in here, so my wife's little <laughs> said so, it works out. <laughs> so we're all willing it to win, too. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, Ethereum has the Ethereum Alliance group. Is there something in the works or something that could potentially form for this as well? Or what was, what was the first part of the question? Ethereum, Ethereum has the Ethereum Alliance group, or it's oh, okay, group. Enterprise Alliance. Yeah. yeah. The, sorry. The, yeah. So that type of thing is probably a little ways away. Uh, I don't think Enterprise is going to join into list until the actual software development kit and tools to make apps are available. Um, then you'll probably see a lot of corporations who maybe might even compete for the delegate spots. I might be I might be competing with large corporations soon, large development groups, development houses who want to make applications for list and they're going to compensate their app through a delegate. And uh, I just want to say one last thing about uh, the voting too. Um, it's actually not a little. Uh, if you vote for the top 101 delegates now, it's over 15% annualized. Yeah. Really? So, yeah. That's it's over what? It's over 15% annualized. Wow. So, um, and, uh, so it's, it's not a small amount. There's nothing else to pay that much for just for holding your coins and voting or participating in you know, the government. Okay. So, um, so your dividends are based on how much you spend in no, the, the voting dividends, process? The dividends are being paid by the delegates who are aiming to secure their position. Like for example, I share 25% of my reward with my voters. Okay. That's that's one way that I've so I propose to, you know, contribute, do the outreach stuff, you know, everything that I've proposed. And a way that I've secured the vote and the support too is by paying a little bit back. Because the amount the delegates are making is exorbitant. We didn't expect the platform to blow up like this. It was worth 17 cents right before the first meeting. Yeah. Six dollars. So that's a good job, yes. <laughs> I'm safe. Can, <laughs> can you give us your name again? I'm at the delegate oh. name. Oh, Stellar Dynamic. I'm ranking 85. So yes, sir. So uh, you you don't think that the Ethereum Plasma sharding solution is going to be comparable to this side chain? I think that they achieve two entirely different things. The Ethereum. First of all, the, the two chains really have two different goals. Ethereum is basically a execution environment that is uniform throughout the entire machine, whereas Lisp is tons of parallelized machines that are running in their own little environment. Um, so they really don't they really don't compete the same way. Um, and also, I think that they will eventually be mutually beneficial because Lisp is going to need sound smart contracts, and Ethereum has been pioneering this for quite some time. Um, and an Ethereum virtual machine could be implemented as a list side chain. So the possibilities there for what you could do with list as the hub, as the uh, parent of the ecosystem, is huge. And I think eventually list will even be bigger. And a little follow up to that would be like, is there a certain like industry or application that you see list as better for than Ethereum? Or, or like, or or the other way around. Are there well, certain I, I think that every application that Ethereum can be used for, it can be implemented on Lisp. Because, like I said, you could you could literally implement the Ethereum virtual machine as a Lisp sidechain. Now, the Ethereum? computational environment is there's there's a lot of there's a lot of balancing going on there. I, I don't know that I can can speak to that actually just yet. Other than to say that um, they both will definitely have some advantages, something that the other one doesn't. Well, if y'all that's uh, it for all the questions. Thank you everybody so much for coming. Uh, we're gonna do another one in December, I believe. We haven't uh, secured the date yet, it will be here. So just keep checking minutes to the meetup.com page. Meetup.com slash list dash blockchain dash new You should all find it. So thank you again. Thanks again everybody. Where? Be